Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to provide an introduction to indifference curves. Before I go ahead and draw out an indifference curve on the axes to my right, the first thing to note is that indifference curves are a way of representing a consumer's preferences over bundles of consumption goods or commodities. In particular, a single indifference curve will connect together different bundles of goods or commodities over which a consumer is indifferent. And it follows from this that along any indifference curve, the level of satisfaction or utility that a consumer gets from their consumption remains constant. So to help make all of this more concrete, let's say that I can consume apples or biscuits. So here on the right, you can see I have two axes and I've labeled each axis, putting apples on the vertical axis and biscuits on the horizontal. Now on this plane here, we can represent all of our possible consumption bundles. Point X, for instance, represents a bundle with three biscuits and six apples. Point Y represents a bundle with two biscuits and four apples. And point Z represents a bundle with six biscuits and two apples. Now let's just say that I value bundle X exactly the same as I value bundle Z. Now that is to say I'm indifferent between them. Now just to clarify what this means. Well, if this was the case, I would get the same level of satisfaction from consuming bundle X, which is three biscuits and six apples, that I would get if I had consumed bundle Z, which is six biscuits and two apples. I wouldn't care which bundle X or Z I got if I had to choose. Now, if that was the case, then X and Z would be on the same indifference curve. And such a curve would maybe look something like this. What the indifference curve does is connect all of the bundles over which I'm indifferent. And so we're indifferent not just between X and Z, but between any other bundle that this line passes through. And that's what indifference curves do. That's what they identify. Bundles of consumption over which I or a consumer is indifferent. Now there are going to be many indifference curves which track all of the preferences over all of the possible bundles of apples and biscuits. So I can draw in more indifference curves like this. And I can also label them. I'm going to put IC1 for indifference curve 1, IC2 and IC3. Whilst each individual line identifies all of the bundles that I am indifferent between, each indifference curve represents a different level of satisfaction and sometimes we call this utility. Now with curves that look like this, we associate a higher level of utility or satisfaction with indifference curves that are further out from the origin. So I prefer any bundle on IC2 or IC3 to any bundle on IC1 and I prefer any bundle on IC3 to any bundle on IC2 or IC1. Sometimes people put arrows on the diagrams like this, and this shows which curves represent higher levels of satisfaction. To explain this in another very useful way, if we focus just on one curve, maybe IC2, if we shade above the line here, this shaded area actually isolates all of the bundles that are preferred to any bundle on IC2. In the remainder of the video, I want to discuss three additional features of indifference curves. The first feature is that indifference curves should never cross. The second feature concerns the interpretation of the slope of our indifference curves, which is called the marginal rate of substitution. The last feature concerns the shape of our indifference curves. So as you can see, these curves that I've drawn here, they go from steeper to flatter as you go from left to right. Now I should say that these indifference curves that I've drawn are very common types of indifference curves. So they represent what is sometimes called well-behaved preferences. But some indifference curves can look very different to the ones I've drawn. So just be aware of that. 
for this introduction, I'm just going to stick to the most uh, common type of shape of curve. So let's start with the first feature. To see why indifference curves cannot cross, let's consider the case if they did cross like this. And I have three bundles A, B and C marked. Now because A is on the same indifference curve as C, they're both on IC1, right? Then we know that we're indifferent between A and C. And we can represent this indifference just with this tilde here, so A tilde C. Likewise, because B is on the same indifference curve to C, they're both on IC2, then we must be indifferent between bundle B and bundle C. But if we're indifferent between A and C, and we're also indifferent between B and C, then it follows that, well, we must be indifferent between A and B. Yet this cannot be correct, because we know that A and B lie on different indifference curves, which means that by definition, that they correspond to different levels of satisfaction. And because of that, we would never be indifferent between them. Now to remove this contradiction, we must not ever allow indifference curves to cross. The second feature I wanted to talk about is about the meaning of the slope of our indifference curves, which is called the marginal rate of substitution. Now, hopefully you recall that we calculate a slope by taking well rise over run, which is the change in the vertical axis variable divided by a change in the horizontal axis variable. Now remember that as we're moving along the indifference curve, the level of satisfaction or utility stays constant. And this means that we can interpret the slope, which has our marginal rate of substitution or MRS, as a measure of how much a consumer trades off between the two goods on our axes, whilst keeping their level of utility or satisfaction constant. So just as an obvious observation, our indifference curves have as I have drawn them, are clearly downward sloping. This just means that we can compensate the loss of one good with more of the other and keep our level of satisfaction constant. To see this, let's start from any point, let's just say bundle X. If we decreased our consumption of say apples, maybe someone took some apples away from us. Well, in order to keep our level of satisfaction constant, we would need to increase the amount of biscuits that we have in our bundle. Now let's just call that new bundle, bundle W. So that the slope is negative, tells us that we can trade off between these two goods. Now the numerical value of the slope at any point will give us the exact information about these trade-offs. To see this, let's look at the move from X to W. Recall that slope is equal to rise over run, and let's find the ratio in this case. Well, our change in our vertical axis is negative two, we're going from six to four apples. And our change in our horizontal axis is one, we're going from three to four biscuits. So it follows that we would be willing to trade off two apples for one additional biscuit. To say this in another way, in this region, we are valuing two apples the same amount as we value one biscuit. Now there is a sleight of hand here because my indifference curves are curved. And so me treating this ratio here as a slope is a little bit cheeky because technically the slope is actually slightly different at point X and at point W. Now indeed, when we talk about the MRS, we're talking about the slope at a particular point on the curve, not the slope of the straight line which connects two points, as I've implicitly done here. Another way to think about this is that without MRS, we're thinking about marginal changes rather than discrete ones. Nevertheless, the interpretation is the same. If I find out the value of the slope of our indifference curve, at bundle X, and just to explain here, the line that I've drawn tangent to this curve is in order to indicate the approximate slope at this point, where we still take that slope value as telling us about how our consumer is trading off between the two goods at that point. So this actually follows on nicely to our last point, which concerns the shape of our indifference curves. 
Now, not only are, are our indifference curves downward sloping, but they also go from steeper to flatter. This means that our slope is getting smaller in absolute value. So whilst the slope maybe up here might be negative four, which means that I trade off four apples for one biscuit. By the time we get to here, maybe our slope is more like negative a half, which means that I would trade off half an apple for one biscuit. And what this means is that I'm valuing my apples more and more as we go to the right of our indifference curve, because if you think about it, I'm willing to trade less and less apples for one biscuit as the slope gets flatter. On these indifference curves, this feature is due to the fact that we tend to value a good more when it's scarce or when we don't have a lot of it. So up here where I have a lot of apples and not much biscuit, if I lose a large amount of apples, I'm not really that fussed. I only need a relatively small amount of biscuits to make up for that loss. So here I value biscuits more and I put less value on apples and this corresponds to valuing a good more when it's scarce or when we don't have a lot of it. Once I get over here though, I don't have many apples and I have heaps of biscuit. And if I lose an apple, that's really hard. I valued that apple a lot because it's so scarce already. I would need a larger amount of additional biscuit to make up for that loss. So I value apples more because they're scarce and biscuits less because they're not. Once again, this corresponds to valuing a good more when it's scarce or when we don't have a lot of it. Now this feature is actually what we call diminishing marginal rate of substitution. And that's characterized by the absolute value of the slope of the indifference curve getting smaller or diminishing. And you can see this, we go steep to flat. And so that's it for this video. It's probably worth saying that this is only an introduction to indifference curves and there is heaps more to say. Nevertheless, I hope that the video did help you. If it did, please like and subscribe and have a really great day or night.